Thank you, Clinton. Clinton's got a little bit of a glow to him now. He's a dad and really getting into it. You know, he's radiant. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. You know, typically, growing up, I heard on Father's Day a sermon about how we can do better if, as fathers, how we need to step it up, and how we need to be leading our family better. When Mother's Day rolled around, it was always the mushy stuff, how great our mothers were, and how, you know, we need to praise them and all that. And I agree with that. But it's like the preacher didn't want to give any kind of impression that he was being critical of the mothers at all, like he was going to be ambushed in the parking lot or something. Of course, he does have to go home with one of those ladies, so maybe that was a valid fear. I'm not going to talk about fathers this morning, but I just want to say, happy Father's Day. Can we not all agree that we all got issues? You know, we've all got some things that we can work on, right? Not every dad is Ray Romano or Tim Allen, and not every mother is June Cleaver or Carol Brady. We all have issues, we all have things that we need to work on, but we have some tremendous mothers and fathers that are doing a tremendous job in raising their children for the Lord, and you should be applauded for that. So happy Father's Day, and also mothers, thank you for all you do. So we're continuing our series on Jesus Is, and we're looking at Jesus Is a Teacher. And man, that's dangerous because the spit's going to be, you might need a poncho. The spit may be flying. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. You know, I've talked to you a lot about my former life as a coach what I haven't talked so much about is I was a teacher as well. They didn't just let me coach. I had to teach classes also. And I enjoyed that. I loved teaching. It was a, a, a very a, a, a great passion of mine. And I want to share with you what my schedule was as a teacher. First period, I had health and PE. Second period, I had elementary PE. Third period, I had junior high basketball. I was the junior high and high school basketball coach. Fourth period, I had driver's ed. Fifth period, I had speech because I was the closest one certified to teaching speech and drama, so I had to do that. Lunch, sixth period, study hall, seventh period, free period, eighth period, basketball and baseball. And you say, well, yeah, Chris, who wouldn't love teaching if that was your schedule? But let me remind you, fourth period was driver's ed. <laughs> Fifteen through 18-year-old kids, one day we hit a vulture, one day we hit a squirrel, one day we hit a dog, and I was trying to console the young lady who was driving. The dog, you know, in her defense, would not get out of the way, and she, I thought she was going to stop, slow down. She didn't, ran right over the dog. It didn't die. Thankfully, it was fine, but I tell her to pull over. The gentleman who owned the dog was sitting on his front porch. I went up and talked to him. We got the dog to safety. It seemed like it was going to be okay. And I thought, well, how am I going to console this young lady who's obviously very upset? She ran over a dog. And I got in the car and I said, Amanda, I want you to know, I think the dog's going to be okay. And a boy from the back seat goes, Coach, I think he was bleeding from the mouth. And I said, would you shut up? <laughs> one day a girl got in and said, uh, which one's the brake and which one's the gas again? And I said, okay, get out. That was after six weeks in the classroom. <laughs> Teaching was fun. It was a joy. It was a privilege. It was a passion of mine. But one of the most interesting things is when my family and I would go into town, we'd go to Walmart to grocery shop, and we'd go up and down the aisles, and inevitably you'd run into somebody you knew, and you would exchange pleasantries and then move on, right? But every now and then I would see one of those elementary students. Again, I coached elementary P.E., and you've got to understand, I represented for them everything that was fun about school. I was their hero. I would come and get them, we'd go to the gym, and we'd play, and I'd play with them, and we had a great time. But every time they saw me at Walmart, this was their response. <laughs> Coach, what are you doing here? Like they couldn't fathom that I actually had a family. They thought I lived at the gym. They didn't understand that I actually had a wife and children and that I did grocery shopping and things like that. It was completely dumbfounding to them that their coach had another life. And there are a lot of people who cannot fathom Jesus as anything more than a teacher. Like those elementary students, all they could see me as was their teacher or their coach. And there are people like that in our world today that only see Jesus as a teacher. They can't comprehend him being anything else. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, it reads, 
Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to him, but who do you say that I am? And that question has reverberated throughout the centuries. How you answer that question means everything. Who do you say that Jesus is? And there's a lot of answers that are still given to that question. It seems like everyone has a Jesus that fits their agenda or their, or their position, whether it be the Democrat Jesus or the Republican Jesus or the no judgment Jesus, whatever it is. It seems that many people want a part of Jesus or they want to make him fit their agenda, but they don't want the true Jesus, the whole Jesus, the one that is Lord of their life. But the claim that Jesus is nothing more than a great moral teacher is really no claim at all. Because if that's true, then Jesus is nothing more for us and our sinful nature than just someone who can tell us we're doing wrong. Obviously, he is more than a great moral teacher. He is the moral authority, right? Because he's God. Everything starts and stops with him. He is the standard. He confirmed his identity, not just through words, but through signs. He also lived what he taught. In order to qualify as a great moral teacher, you also have to live with impeccable character, right? And certainly Jesus did. He was perfect. But the crucial question that Jesus asked in Matthew chapter 16 is one that every single person must answer. And, and what are we to make of Jesus? That's really what it boils down to. What are we to make of Jesus? And may I suggest to you that the option of him just being a good teacher is not good enough. Look with me at John chapter 3. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus has great respect for Jesus. He recognizes him as a teacher, even a teacher that has come from God. And he should get partial credit, right? Because Jesus is a great teacher that has come from God. But he was more than that, much more. Nicodemus made a comment about Jesus being a great rabbi, and Jesus immediately takes things to the next level, doesn't he? Notice what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so the education of Nicodemus has started. In that one sentence, Jesus sweeps away everything that Nicodemus stood for. Think about that for just a moment. That one sentence by our Lord is a demand for this Pharisee to completely reorient his life. Think about the implications of this for Nicodemus. To be born a Jew was to be born in the kingdom of God. In essence, Jesus is saying your natural birth, your heritage won't save you. And Jesus' message was not just a message for Nicodemus. Because notice again what Nicodemus said, we know that you are a teacher from God. Who's the we? Well, we have to assume that him and his cohorts, right? The other Pharisees, at least some of them, knew as well that he had to be a teacher that's come from God. And so Jesus' message wasn't just for Nicodemus. It was for all of those that agreed with Nicodemus. The kingdom is at hand and you're not in it. That was the message to Nicodemus. In order for Nicodemus and the other religious leaders to enter into the promised land, the kingdom that Jesus had recognized, that he had told them about, they had to see him as more than just a rabbi. So turn now to Mark chapter 12. And after a spirited discussion with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes on the topic of resurrection, Jesus gives us the Shema, which in the Jewish orthodoxy is a prayer, the Shema. The foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe responds, right, teacher, as if Jesus wasn't right. 
right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And notice how Jesus responds to that. He tells him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, pay attention to what is written then in verses 35 and following. And Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. In his teaching, he was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Now Jesus is teaching the teachers, and he did this quite often. When he asks, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David, he's not directly referring to himself. What he's really asking is, how can the scribes say that God's anointed king who is to come is the son of David? And then he quotes Psalm 110 and verse 1. And that's significant because the Jews at this time believed that all the Psalms were written by David. They assumed that. They also believed that this Psalm referred to the coming Messiah. And in verse 1 of Psalm 110, David calls the coming Messiah his Lord. So, Jesus, the master teacher, asked the question, If I am David's son, how can he address me as Lord? You see, Jesus is not denying that the Messiah is the Son of God, or the Son of David. Nor is he denying that he himself is the Son of David. He is saying that he is more than the Son of David. Not only is he David's son... He is David's Lord. That's pretty confusing, but do you see what he's getting at? So after addressing the topic of his identity, the teacher warns the crowd about their teachers. You know, as long as they uphold the law and they tell you to uphold the law, that's fine. But don't follow in their footsteps because these people are hypocrites. They're not teaching you the right way. And you know why they're not teaching you in the right way? Because they don't care about you. They care about status. They care about appearances. But they don't care about you, the people. Jesus, of course, is the master teacher, the master rabbi who is passionate about the subject, but he's passionate about the subject because he's passionate about people. Not only did he come to educate them, he came to rescue them. Remember your favorite teacher? We probably all had a favorite teacher. I had a teacher who was a coach who rolled out the ball and told us to go play while he read the newspaper. I love that teacher. We just ran amok and did whatever we wanted to while he read the newspaper. How about your favorite teacher? How about your best teacher? They're different, aren't they? Probably the best teacher you ever had is different than your favorite teacher. Maybe, maybe not. But I had a best teacher, and I didn't really like her at the time. She was tough. She was hard-nosed. No nonsense. You came down, you plopped yourself in the seat, and you looked straight ahead, and you didn't talk. You didn't chew gum. You didn't do any of that. You listened, and you took notes. The tests were hard. The homework was hard. But she better prepared me than any other teacher I ever had. She was my best teacher. When we talk about favorite teacher and best teacher, they're probably two different things. Maybe your favorite teacher was the one that let you get away with murder. Maybe your best teacher was the one who prepared you for life after high school or after college. That was the biggest problem with the religious teachers. They didn't have a passion for their students. They had a passion for the law, and it was even misguided. But they didn't have a passion for people. Jesus came. He was strict. He was uncompromising, he came to bring the truth, but he also had a passion for people. Jesus was without a doubt the greatest communicator to ever live. He was not just a footnote to all other rabbis. He was the greatest. He was a storyteller, a metaphor maker, a sage, always ready with a proverb or an aphorism or a riddle or a one-liner 
Whatever form of communication he used, his strategy was always the same, and it was threefold. He was audience-specific, he was highly participatory, and he was scripturally tethered. And here's something else I love about Jesus' teaching style. It is perhaps the most important point, and that is that his listeners seemed to always drive the conversation. He was always audience-focused. He was always listener-focused. You think about how often the audience or the crowd drove his agenda. More times than not, right? And that just makes sense. Because people are why he came. The pupils were the very people that he came to not only educate, but also to rescue. So, I've asked you about your favorite teacher. What about your favorite subject? Any guesses what uh, Jesus' favorite subject was? I'll tell you, mine in school was second lunch. I had two lunches my senior year. This was before dual credit, so don't judge me too much. I had two lunches. One, I ate lunch. The first one, the second one, I got to do whatever. Then I had study hall. Then I had athletics, and then I got to go home. What was Jesus' favorite subject? Here it is. Kingdom. Everything he taught revolved around this. Everything he taught revolved around this subject. In Scripture, the word kingdom can be rather abstract, but it can refer to rule or reign of a king. In fact, when you see kingdom in the New Testament, when you see the New Testament speaking of God's kingdom, that is precisely what is being referred to. Not a place or a people, but the rule and reign of the Heavenly Father. And this is important because many times you'll hear people in the church equate church with kingdom. They're synonymous. No, they're not. There is a sense in which they overlap because the church is the people, right? And kingdom contains people. But it's not a perfect description to say kingdom means church or church means kingdom. That's an inadequate definition. When the New Testament speaks about kingdom or the kingdom of heaven, it's not a reference to a place. The place of heaven is not what's being discussed. No, the kingdom of heaven is referencing the rule and reign of heaven. It's kind of like you consider the term office. Many of you have an office. It's a physical place where you sit down and you do work. But some of you have an office as well. The office of an elder. James doesn't have an office here at the church where he does elder stuff. When we talk about office of elder, you know what I'm talking about. Or the office of CEO. Yes, a CEO may have an office where he physically does work, but that's also a description of the office he holds, the title he has. talks about an office. Does that make sense? And so kingdom is much the same way. It can be defined as a place with people and all that, but it also can refer to this abstract meaning This idea of an office that's being held. You go to Daniel chapter 2. You look at verse 44. It reads, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. Now, the prophets, especially the minor prophets, talked about a coming kingdom. Micah, for instance, stated that it would be a kingdom made up of a remnant of the tribes of Israel and people from every nation on earth. Isaiah speaks of the coming king and that God would anoint this king to be over his kingdom. And of course, we know that that is Jesus. This anointed one would bring about an eternal era of peace and prosperity to all whom reigned and and, and ruled, to all whom he reigned and ruled over, I should say. When Jesus came, Announcing the kingdom that the prophets had foretold, he did so primarily in parables. Now, I always had this idea, and maybe you did as well, that the Jews completely missed it when it came to the kingdom and the Messiah. And that's not exactly true. The Jews knew exactly what the prophets were pointing to. They knew all about this kingdom thing. What they got wrong is the nature of it. What they got wrong and what they completely missed is the anointed one, the Messiah, that he would be a spiritual deliverer, all those things that we've talked about on several occasions, right? That's where they missed it. And so, when we look at this, this, this kingdom and this king and what the prophets pointed to, Jesus 
constantly paints a picture, and it's very different than what the Jews had thought. The Messiah was going to come, and he was going to rule with an iron fist, and he was going to set up an earthly kingdom, and he was going to dispense of all their enemies. No, the Messiah is going to be killed by the enemies. Well, that didn't make any sense. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Jesus talks about the kingdom over and over again in Matthew chapter 13. You have the sower referring to the right type of heart that enables it to receive the word and to allow it to grow inside of them and make them faithful. You have the parable of the weeds, which talks about you know, this evil kingdom that's going to be running in alignment with the kingdom of God. And then eventually that, the folks in that kingdom, that will be burned up and then you'll have the eternal kingdom. You have the leaven and the mustard seed. Jesus is teaching about how the kingdom will not come about in one fell swoop, but rather will be gradual, slowly, over time. Then you have the treasure and the pearl, which talks about the precious nature of the kingdom and how it's worth giving up everything in order to possess it. Then you look at the end of this section in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus says, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. And folks, this is why it just drives me nuts when Christians say, we don't need the Old Testament, we're New Testament Christians. That's baloney. Everything that we have today, we see pointed to in the Old Testament. And right here, in Jesus' teaching on the kingdom, he says, if you're going to understand the kingdom, then you've got to take the old and combine it with the new. They're two halves. They go together. The old points to the new. The old is the basis for the new. It all comes together. And Jesus said, if you want to understand what I'm talking about, what the prophets talked about, if you want to get those new treasures, you have to comprehend the old that comes with it. The anticipated Messiah had arrived. The one the prophets had spoken of and pointed to was standing in their midst, which also meant that the kingdom had arrived. But he didn't set up this kingdom by killing others. No, instead he allowed himself to be killed by others. And to be a part of this kingdom meant to take up your cross and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Other kingdoms are established by war and by conquering the enemy, but not this kingdom. God's kingdom is set up through meekness and self-sacrifice, which was a very foreign way of thinking for the people and actually a very foreign way of thinking for Americans today, isn't it? Jesus came to bring the kingdom that the prophets had spoken of. It was his favorite subject to teach because it was what he was all about. Jesus has, is, and will continue to bring about the kingdom. You see, as the great priestly king, Jesus is bringing God to the people by fully revealing God to us. And he is bringing us to God by taking away our sins. That's why Jesus came to this earth, to rescue us, to reveal God, to bring us closer to him, to restore what was broken in the Garden of Eden. He reigns and rules as our mediator, bringing grace and mercy and forgiveness. This is the reign of the Son of Man. Jesus is the one through whom the Father currently reigns. He is the one Isaiah prophesied of that the Father has anointed to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prison to those who are bound. He is the one who came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all those who mourn, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. But the Father will not always operate through a mediator. Go back and read 1 Corinthians 15 sometime and you see this spelled out very plainly. This current arrangement is not the end goal. The end goal is that after Jesus rises from the dead, Paul says, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. In other words, one day all evil will be vanquished. Evil doers will face judgment. The sons and daughters of the kingdom will enjoy the reign and rule of God forever and ever. God will no longer reign through a mediator. He will rule himself. Jesus' mission of uniting God with humanity will be complete. Sin and death will be no more. Therefore, humanity no longer needs a, uh, a mediator, right? Jesus will still reign, but he will be glorified to reign with God. That's Romans 8, 17, 2 Timothy 2 and 12 and other places. The Father will finally be with the redeemed and the royal family will be complete. And 
then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. My belief is, and you can disagree with this, but my belief is, if the church understood more about heaven, it would completely change the way we operate. We have often been told that heaven's just somewhere up there in the clouds, and the Bible really doesn't say much about it. Absolutely not true. The Bible says a whole lot about it. And over the coming weeks and months, we'll be talking more about it. But if we could get in touch with the kingdom of heaven, what it means to be a part of that, and where our future lies, how different I think we would all act, and how much hope we would have. We're not going to float around on a cloud playing a harp, folks. We get to spend eternity in the promised land with the heavenly Father, where he will rule and reign forever and ever. What a glorious thought, right? There may be a lot of great uh, uh, topics or subjects that are your favorite, but there's none better than that one. I want to offer an invitation to you this morning. Clinton's going to lead us in a song. If we can help you in some way, if you need the prayers, support of this church family, it's been a rough three or four months for people. If we can help you in some way, if you're ready to put on Christ this morning, ready to begin a life of discipleship, or you're ready to study about what it means to be a kingdom citizen, we want to help you with that. Whatever your need is, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing?